Did you guys enjoy your uh, holidays at Christmas and all that? Yeah, you did. That's good. I'm glad somebody is listening. Great. We had a great time, and uh, uh, hopefully you guys did. Our family, we had a great time. We had great Christmas services as well at all of our campuses. And so, uh, speaking of campuses, my name is Aaron, and I'm our uh, campus pastor at Scottsdale. And I'm uh, excited to be here with you tonight. And if you have your Bible, open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Hopefully, 1 Corinthians isn't a shocker to you. Uh, That's what book we've been going through, uh, through the mind. And uh, I'm excited uh, to be able to teach and to share with you this evening. So uh, those of you who are making your way in, come on in and open up to 1 Corinthians 9. And we're going to jump right in here right now. So... um, Have you ever, and we're not, this is not a question to answer out loud, just raise your hand uh, so we don't need any runners here, but have you ever been on the receiving end of someone talking bad about you? Yeah, you you, you answered out loud, it's okay, that's fine. Um, You know, have you ever been uh, in a position where uh, somebody uh, was opposing you? Maybe you didn't know about it, but it got back to you, and they were against what you were for, uh, and they were talking smack about you and opposing what you had going on. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. Oh, man. Well, interestingly enough, that's exactly what we're running into with the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul was one of those super bold men. I mean, extremely bold guys and very uh, conviction-oriented, truth-centered kind of guy. And so he had a tendency to kind of rub people the wrong way. When you stand for things that are other people may, might not stand for, you stand for truth. It's hard when others might not necessarily know the truth and know the full uh, body of the truth. You kind of rub people the wrong way a little bit. And Paul is running into this kind of deal with these Corinthian believers. Uh, they were really kind of, I don't know if they were ticked off at him, but they were kind of opposing him. Uh, in their day and age, they treated people, have you heard of the, the phrase or the name Stoics? You ever heard that before? Uh, philosophers, those kinds of people, those men who were trained in that field were often treated like pastors. And so um, what would happen in their day is these like Roman philosophers and Stoics and all of these religious leaders of pagan religion, uh, they would go out and they would itinerantly preach, meaning going from city to city to city to share their thing. And oftentimes in that culture, what would happen is they would come into a city and it was very common uh, for the local pagan temple to welcome them and get fired up that they're there and then maybe take them out to dinner afterwards and have them stay at a very elaborate house with one of the members of that congregation and they would uh, uh, pay them and they would pay them very well and it would be very, very, very unheard of for one of these people of their day uh, to have another job um, and to do something other than what they're doing. And what happened, and if you know the story of Paul, then you know uh, that yes, Paul was an apostle and yes, Paul was uh, a church planter, but uh, maybe you don't know this, but that's not necessarily what he did for a living. Uh, What that man did for a living was he made tents. And so he would work all day long doing what he did for the church, and then he would go out and he would make tents, and him and Barnabas and a couple of other unnamed guys would go out, and they would go make these tents, and what happened was these guys in Corinth were going, this guy's not the real deal. If he was the real deal, he'd come in, we'd be able to whine in and dine in like all the other pagan religious leaders, and we'd put him up in a big house, and he'd, we'd pay him, you know, all this kind of stuff, and if Paul now is refusing all of those things, say, no, 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 you don't pay me to do what I do. I'm going to go make tents and then I'm going to be able to do this free of charge. And that created a massive problem uh, with these Corinthian believers. And so they were very opposed to what he was doing. That sets the stage. So if you've ever been opposed, if you've ever been hated on, so is the apostle Paul. And we're going to jump in first Corinthians chapter nine in verse one. And basically Paul comes right out of the gate and starts talking about Paul's rights. And right out of the gate, he says, am I not free? Now he is going to, now let me tell you this before we get any further. This guy is going to be laden with sarcasm tonight. 
Like it's almost like this whole chapter is tone is taking on this tone of sarcasm to these Corinthian believers. And all of these questions that he's asking really actually demand the, well, duh, kind of answer. Yes, you are. So he says, am I not free? And the answer would be, duh. Everybody said? Duh. duh. Yes, thank you. Uh, he said, yes, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen our Lord? Are not you, yeah, you don't have to duh every time. If you want to, you can. Uh, are not you my workmanship in the Lord? Here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, listen, I have a right to be free, um, and I also have the right to be an apostle. And these guys are totally questioning his apostleship. So how in the world do we know that someone is an apostle? Does anybody know that answer before I answer it for us? Does anybody know? Like, has anybody, Jim knows, and he's working the camera. Give him the mic. Let him pull double duty. What is it, Jim? Has actually seen Jesus. Now, clarification on seen Jesus, it is the resurrected Jesus that they had seen. It was the resurrected Christ. And so how do we know, this is something you can jot down, how do we know uh, that he's an apostle? First, he even said it in the first, uh, third part of verse one, he said, answered it in a question, which the answer is what? Duh, have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? So he had seen the resurrected Christ. In Acts chapter one, verse 21 and 22, you get that whole piece of, uh, in the early church, that an apostle was someone who had seen the resurrected Christ. Great thing to jot down. Um, and as a matter of fact, when did he see him? Acts chapter nine and verse five, Jesus on the, uh, Paul is on, then Saul, is on a road heading to a town to go and massacre Christians. And then out of the blue, not to Jesus, but to Saul, out of nowhere, a bright light shines on him and he is enveloped by the glory of God, the person of Jesus, the resurrected Christ. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Jesus calls out to him and that was him seeing the resurrected Christ in a glorified body, which qualified him at that point to be an apostle. And so then, so he's seen Jesus. And then the second thing was uh, fruitful ministry. How do we know that uh, he was an apostle? He had seen Christ and he had a fruitful ministry, an effective, fruitful ministry. And here's where I get that right out here um, in uh, the last part of verse one. He says, are, um, are not you my workmanship? Um, I, I tried to read a note I wrote here. Um, a, a product that has been produced. That's what workmanship means. Are you not a product of faithful service in ministry, Corinth? The believers that are at this church, he goes on and says, if to others I'm not an apostle, I don't really care if I'm not an apostle to other people, but you, it should matter to you. At least I am to you, he says, for you are the seal of my apostleship and the Lord. The believers at the church at Corinth were a product of this man's faithfulness to the Lord and his fruit, they are fruit, living and active fruit of I shared the gospel, you heard the gospel, you were piqued, your interest was in the gospel and then you believed it and you have lived it out in your life and you are a product of a ministry that I have had in the city of Corinth. This church is a visual representation of my impact in ministry in life, it's a fruitful ministry. And he says that you are a seal of my apostleship. You know, in the Bible times, a seal, uh, there's several different ways. They would send, put, you know, people would send things and put a seal on a container to make sure that it was preserved and it was good and it was okay that when it was opened, it was verified that that was the real deal. You know, um, they would do that with mail so that if a king or uh, somebody that was a big wig in the political system would send an email edict or a letter out to people to certify, to certify it as real, genuine, and authentic, they would put a drop of wax and fold it up, put a drop of wax on the paper, and then they would have a signet ring that would be their seal of who that person was or their family or whatever they did in, the, uh, in their system, and they would stamp that wax and leave it in there till it dried, and it would certify it as a certifiable, genuine, authentic piece of information 
given to a group of people. And what Paul is saying that, hey, my um, apostleship is hinging on the reality that I really did see Jesus and that your faith and your trust in Christ has, is legitimately a seal of authenticity to all who see that Jesus is who he is and he's been working through me and your faith is proof that Jesus is using me to save people. You're a seal. You're a seal. And he's on this way proving all of these people are opposing him. And he's saying, and I'm going to set this right. I'm going to show you really who I actually am. So Paul has rights, rights to be free, right to be an apostle. He also has the right to be supported. Look with me in verse 3. He has the right to be uh, supported. Verse 3, he says, now this is my defense to those who would examine me. This is my defense. This is, do we have any attorneys in the house? Any attorneys? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, awesome. So you'll, you should get this then. This is cross-examining. You examine me. You put me to the test. I'm going to give a testimony and you put it to the test to see if it's not real. And so there's a lot of legal language going on here. And so he steps into this whole thing and he has the right to be supported. Look at this second part here. He says, verse four, here's defense number one. Do we not have the right, this is him and Barnabas, talking about him and Barnabas, do we not have the right to eat and drink? So that doesn't mean much to us now and it will in just a moment, but what he's saying is, is don't I have the right at least for you to provide me food, to provide me something to drink? Isn't that the bare minimum of care for someone who is pouring into you as a pastor and as a leader? Doesn't it seem right that you would take me to Chick-fil-A and get me a sandwich? Does that, that seems reasonable, right? I'm not asking for a filet mignon at one of these resorts around our town. I'm not asking. I'm just saying something. That's what he's saying. It's simple. It's a way to, uh, to be supported and to be uh, encouraged. He said, that seems right. That's defense number one. It's okay to do this. Number two, he talks about companionship. Right here in verse five, he says, do we not have the right to take on a believing wife? Don't I have the right to get married? Some scholars actually think that this is Paul saying, some way, I can't find grounds for it, but I can see where they're getting at. The language says in such a way that maybe Paul, when he first got saved, had a wife and she had passed away and she came along with him. We don't know that for sure. But what we do know is what he says is, shouldn't it be a right of mine to have companionship and ministry? There are other people who have, this is what he says, uh, as do other apostles and uh, the brother of our Lord, that would be James, the brother of Jesus. He had a wife and Cephas, which is Peter. He had a wife and he's saying, listen, I have a right to be supported with food and drink. I have a right to be supported with companionship that you shouldn't be hating on me. If I choose to be single, I choose that, but you shouldn't put another requirement on me. He's saying, I have a right to be this way. And then he gets dripping with sarcasm. This is awesome, verse six. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? This is just me and Barnabas. We are the ones that have to go out here and do all this by ourselves. He's saying that there's a double standard in play. So, why should you support ministry? Think about this and don't answer it. Paul is proving a point. This is why you should support me as your pastor, as your shepherd, as someone who loves you and cares for you and thinks about you all week long. Like, you know, that's what, I don't know what other pastors do, but that's what I do. Like when I'm planning ministry and I'm planning times where I'm leading Bible studies or sermons or whatever it is, like whatever you're doing, what you're doing to make a living, what I'm doing to make a living is sitting here and thinking about you. And thinking about what God's doing in your life and how this is going to impact your life and how we can help, you know, um, uh, help steward environments to help you grow in your relationship with God. That's what we're doing as a team. That's what we're thinking about. And so we're thinking and praying and thinking and praying and thinking and praying. And that's what we do. And as you give, you're funding the ministry to move forward in those types of ways. And so Paul is saying in his day, so why should you support me? He's building a case of people who don't want to pay him for his job and say, here's why you should be able to do this. And he says this. He gives five reasons why you should support his ministry. Are you ready? This is fun to jot down. Super easy. Number one, uh, common culturally. 
It was so common in their culture to pay someone for a job well done. It was in every single field, in every single area of job and economy, they paid a guy for his job, for what he did. And here's his examples. He gives three of them. He says in verse seven, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Anybody serve in the military? Anybody? Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have family who has served. um, And I was sitting here as I read that, I thought it would be absurd for a, a man or a woman in battle. Think with me in battle, fighting to preserve our freedom and do that all day long. And then the way that they support their family is to go work at the Gap and fold sweaters at night. No, 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 no. See, the point is is that, that what they're doing for their vocation as a soldier, it's reasonable for us to believe, well, of course we should pay them to preserve our freedom and to protect our rights as Americans. That's what Paul's saying now, not in an American context, but it makes sense. Pay the, uh, the men, pay the women to do what they do. He goes on and he gives another example. He gives, uh, so there's a soldier and then there's a farmer, uh, one who plants a vineyard without, e- who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit. Who does that? It's reasonable for someone. My father-in-law grew up on a farm and he was, he was just here over Christmas and he was talking about, you know, that they always ate off of the land, right? They would, they would plant their crops and pull a little bit off for them to eat as a family and then they'd go sell the rest. That was what they did for a living and it was reasonable for them to reap where they sowed, if you will. Third example he gives is, uh, or uh, who tends a flock? He's a rancher or a shepherd without getting some of the milk. Who doesn't do that? Who doesn't provide for their family and then go and use that as their vocation to provide food and provide a living for their family? It's totally common in their day. So it was a farmer, it was a rancher, and it was a soldier. Three examples they would have gotten. They would have gone, well, I kind of see what you're doing now. I kind of see where you're driving. That's reasonable to pay those guys for a job well done. So it was culturally common. That's why you should support Paul. Number two is that scripture endorses it. Look at verse eight, all right? In verse eight, he says, he goes on to this and he says, do I say these things on human authority? He's asking the question to which the answer is what? Well, no, or it's in the affirmative. He's, you affirm his statement. Uh, no, I'm not saying this uh, under human authority. He says, he goes a step further and he says, does not the law say the same thing? The law. He's saying, he's actually quoting the Bible. In their day, he said, he would have said it in a modern paraphrase in their day. Uh, the Bible says, like we do in our day, we say, well, the Bible says, because we have the whole book. In their day, they had the Old Testament, all those scriptures. And so they would say, well, the law, that's the same way of saying, well, the Bible says, your Bible says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Well, that's weird. What does that mean? Well, in the law, God was making a provision for the farmers and the people that would cultivate the land to say, hey, don't go kill your ox in the, in the field. Let the ox with the hard day's work of tilling the soil, let him eat while he's doing that. Feed him. And the, it's, a, it's a principle done throughout the Bible where if the lesser is true, then the greater would be true. Are you following me? So if the lesser is true, then the greater is true. The lesser being that if we're gonna take care of our animals, then don't you think God would want us to take care of what would be the greater? Huh? Ourselves, Ourselves people, our family, our, 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 our people that are around us. So the lesser, does God care for animals? Let me answer that question for you. Yes, he does. That's what he says. Does he not serve? But he says, uh, is it not for oxen that God is concerned? Well, yeah, he's concerned for them, but his prized possession is what? Us, human beings. And so he, this is what he says. He goes, does he not certainly speak for our sake? And he says, it was written for you, man. It was written for human beings. It was written for us so that we would know, the principle would be, is that we're not gonna cut off a guy for a job well done. No, nah, man, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna do so much in our part as far as it depends upon us to not make money an issue for that guy, for Paul. We're gonna, we're gonna take care of him. We're gonna take care of our own and we're gonna provide. We're gonna provide for them. And uh, so scripture endorses it. Their Bible says it. Um, and he goes on 
And he says, uh, it was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and thre- the thresher should thresh in hope of sharing the crop. Now he says this huge word that's not big, but he says, if, <laughs> if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Do you see what he's doing there? He's talking like a, they're, they're, like he's talking as a, I want to use the word not pastor, not preacher, but I want to use the word like shepherd because that's the best, most caring and loving word I could say is he is caring for the people at that church. And, 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 and he's, the, uh, quite honestly, he probably led many of these people to the Lord. I mean, literally explained what life was like before Christ, how I met Christ, and how my life has been impacted since Christ. Can you imagine hearing the words from Paul's mouth about, I used to kill people like you, and now I don't. God has saved me, and God has changed me, and he shared his story and put that before those people, and they're thinking, dude, if God could do that to you, then surely God could do that to me. I I didn't do what you did. I'm just a banker. or I'm whatever, you know, and they prayed to receive Christ, and their lives were changed, and they were impacted, and he had planted and, or hold on, he had, he had sown seed in that field of Corinth, and now he's reaped a harvest of souls, and he's saying it would only make sense that you would provide for me, and you would support me. Now, he uses the word if. So when is it okay to not support that guy? Well, he uses the word if. Do you remember, this was some months ago, I was teaching you and we used, um, it was um, 1 Corinthians um, 4. Just turn back over there. When do we not support? When would it be okay for, if you just keep it in context to the Corinthians, when would it have been okay for the Corinthians not to support Paul? It would have been if he was a terrible shepherd. If he was in it for the wrong reasons, I'm thinking about The Bachelor right now, you know, that's the one thing they always say all the time, I'm here for the right reasons. I'm, I, listen, I confess in front of all of you, I've seen the show. I watched it last week with my wife. It's, you know, one of those things, you just do it. Uh, forego football to watch that, I guess, and so, it's because I love her. But um, he said, in, uh, but, but, but uh, if they're in it for the wrong reason, then that's when you start going, hey man, what? What's going on here with you? And you have that brotherly conversation of brotherly calling them out on the carpet and putting that out there and saying, hey, truth says this, Bible says this, you're doing this, where are we at with that? And so he says in 1 Corinthians 4, this is how one should regard us, these are shepherds as pastors, uh, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful that they be found faithful. So when is it appropriate to pull the plug and to start asking the tough questions? When they haven't been faithful. faithful. Now that's a hard one to judge, wouldn't you agree? Who who, Who would say that, nah man, that is not, I can judge somebody's faithfulness right now, right now, give me the microphone. Okay, good, nobody raised their hand. I was getting really nervous for a second because I thought somebody would. But no, we can't judge the heart. God does that. But we can't look at fruit of someone's life. And the fruit of Paul's life would have been all of these church startups. I mean, after a period of years of him pouring himself into the scriptures and being with the apostles and learning the ways of Christianity, all of a sudden, the bro went crazy. I mean, just went nuts planting church after church after church after church. And the fruit of his life was this guy is extremely, insanely faithful. And so he's worthy of that. He's worthy of being supported. He's worthy of being loved in that way. And so um, why should we support him? Why should we support ministry leaders? It's common culturally. It's, the scripture endorses it. Number three, uh, in this context, you've already done it. The church had already done it. That would be like you saying, I'm not paying that pastor whatever he does in our, on our staff or that church leader. And then we would go, well, hold on now. We, we, we're paying other people. Why wouldn't we do that? And that's what they're saying. Look at right here. It says, um, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much to reap material things from you? If others share this same rightful claim on you, do not we even more. And he says even more, meaning, listen, you've supported Peter. 
You've supported James. You've supported all these other guys who didn't start you and we started you. Don't you think we deserve that even more? To which the answer is, absolutely. Absolutely you do. Historical custom affirms that we should support ministry. Verse 13. Well, let me skip down. He says, nevertheless, verse 12, nevertheless, the door flings open right here, flings wide open to what matters most. And he says, we have not made use of this right. You catch what he's doing here? He's saying, dude, you should support me as your pastor. You should support me as your leader. You should, I, we, I led you to the Lord. We're planning these Bible studies. We're doing all these things for you because we love you and you should support that. And then Paul goes, oh, hold on. We deserve it. And then he goes, but hold on. We have not made use of this right. Is it right to take care of Paul? Huh? Is it right to take care of church leaders? And Paul says, in his instance, I don't want you doing that. Say what? He says, we, we, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. I don't know about you, but this is what I do for a living. <laughs> and so that's super convicting for a man to go, you know what? I don't want anything to get in the way of you coming to Jesus. And you have to ask yourself, why in the world would Paul say that? And the reason Paul would say that is because he used to be Saul. There's many reasons, but this is the best reason I can come up with. He used to be Saul. Meaning, his story, his reputation, what people knew about this man was that he used to kill Christians and that he was about himself. And he did what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. It was about gain. That was the Roman culture. You just got to one up the next guy. It's, I'm, listen, I'm choking everybody who I want to go climb over to get to the top of the ladder. That's what I'm doing. And that was his reputation. Christian killer Saul. And so he knew going into Corinth that that's what everybody thought about this guy. And so he had a lot of obstacles to overcome. And one of them, and you know this in our culture today, right? I mean, how many times do you turn on Daystar or TBN or whatever that is? If you've watched that, I'm not, maybe you do. And you can, can't go five seconds without somebody throwing up a telephone number and call to donate. You can't go five seconds without that. And I'm not judging what they do. I'm just telling you that what Paul's fear was is I don't want you to think I'm in it for the money. I don't want you to think that I'm in it to build myself a bigger house, to drive a better car, to have nicer clothes, to do whatever they would do in their culture. I don't want you to think I'm in it for that because I think that'll be a stumbling block for you and for uh, many people in this area to come to Christ. And the reality is, is I think that's a stumbling block for many people to come to Christ today. I don't think it's just for Paul. I think it's today. And I think that's why it's our job as church leaders for you. You can help keep us accountable to that spirit and that attitude. That's what it, it means to be a part of a family. When you see somebody in your family going off sideways, you yank them, right? That's what I do to my kids. If I see them going in front of a car, I just grab their collar. They're seeing them heading towards danger, loving things they're not supposed to love, doing things they're not supposed to do. What do you do? What should you do? Run after them because you love them. So verse 13 supports historical custom. History is on their side. The Bible tells us that Abraham brought tithes to Melchizedek in the temple 400 years before the law was ever given to Moses. 400 years before the law was ever written that you should give a tenth of all that you have to the Lord. Before that was ever laid down, he did it 400 years before that giving to the church and supporting the ministry of the church. History is on our side. Thousands of years of churchgoers have supported the local church. 
And he goes on and he says, look at this, verse 13, here's a, what the history is on our side. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? That was customary that when people, obviously they didn't all, everybody have, you know, plastic debit cards and checks and all that. Obviously, the culture is so different. And a lot of times in their culture, what was monetary coin or paper was more like animal and food. So whatever they would harvest in the field or whatever they would raise on the ranch or in the flock, they would take a tenth of whatever that was and bring that to the temple as an as a offering, as a gift to God for the faithfulness of God in their life. I'm gonna be faithful to the Lord in that. And so that's how these um, uh, leaders in their day uh, were taken care of and they were supported. And those who serve, second part of the verse, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. Don't you know that? History is on their side. Hundreds and hundreds of years support supporting local leaders. Verse five, Jesus commands it. Not verse five, verse 14, Jesus commands it. That's number five. So culturally, uh, um, it's common in culture. Scripture endorses it. You've already done it. Historical uh, custom, and Jesus commands it in verse 14, which is probably the easiest one to go, well, okay. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. This is what they do. And Paul's saying, I'm making a case for this. You should support this. Uh, and he's probably referencing just a jot. Luke 10, 7, when Jesus, if you remember in the Gospels, where he sent out the 70 to go do ministry, uh, this is a part where many scholars believe he's referencing uh, that they should make their provision and uh, be provided for and supported um, by the church. So Paul is building this case that, hey, I think you should take care of Paul and Barnabas. I think you should do this. I think you should be a part of that process. It's a good, healthy family process. Now, you guys are looking at me funny, just so you know that. And I know this is awkward for me to tell you this, okay? It's just as awkward for me as it is for you to say, hey, you should support your pastors, you should support your staff, you should give to the church so that they can do this for you. I know that, I get that, but I'm just trying to tell you this is what the Bible tells us, okay? So thank you for the laugh, I appreciate that. That kind of makes me feel a little better. So... Paul has rights, but check this out. Paul refuses his rights. I'm getting to the questions just so you know. I gotta get all this out so that then we can have a good discussion. So Paul refuses his rights, verse 15. But if I had made no use of any of these rights, what rights? Well, the right to be supported, the right to have a wife, the right to eat and the right, not, I mean, he did eat, but it's the right to not make tents and to be paid vocationally as a pastor. He says, I haven't taken any of those. He's reiterating what he said in verse 12. I've made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any of those provisions. He's going, listen, I'm not, I'm not, have you ever had somebody drop subtle hints in a conversation that they want you to do something for them? Yeah. Right. I have too. Like my dad used to do it to me when I was a kid. Man, that yard's getting kind of long, Aaron. Subtle hint, you should go cut the grass. Or Joy was told me a couple of weeks ago, she was like, man, that laundry really is stacking up. AKA, you should help fold the clothes a little bit. You know, man, the kids are really smelling. You should give them a bath. Those kinds of things. It's dropping subtle hints. That's, he's saying, I'm not doing that. I'm not saying, hey, you should, you should provide, you should support, you should provide, you should support, and I'm, I'm coming through the back door uh, hoping that you'll do that for me. I'm not doing that at all. And then he does this emotional outburst. This is Paul. He's really fiery, right? And he says, I'd rather die, man, than you do that. Look at what he says in the next sentence in verse 15. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. Now, he's not boasting like an arrogant man. He's boasting in what God has done in him and that God has called him to this specific thing. It's really more about the Lord and less about him. And so he's saying, listen, this is what God's called me to do. And if you rob me of that calling, then I'm gonna be doing not what the Lord has called me to do. So don't get in the way of that. And I'm not trying to get paid for that. So don't even give me a love offering. Now, don't get this confused with the fact that, uh, because if you'll read, you'll know that Paul did receive support. He did. He just didn't harvest where he is currently sowing. In 2 Corinthians, you'll see where he talks to the Thess about the Thessalonians, where he was like, dude, you know, um, we're now, they're funding my ministry for you right now. 
like they're paying my way. They're, I'm a missionary from the church at Thessalonica, so to speak, and they're sending me here to Corinth so that I can do ministry for you. And so Paul is a really, really nervous about somebody in the church writing a fat check to the ministry of Paul and then coming over around Paul and jockeying for political position to get the right carpet that that guy wants or to get the color paint on the wall that that guy wants or to get the ministry funded that that guy wants. Paul's going, I will not be a political puppet for anybody in the church, so I'm not gonna take any money from you. That's what he's saying. And some of you are like, man, that doesn't happen. Oh my gosh, get in line. I could talk for 45 minutes after this service about how that happens. Not at this church, but at a lot of churches where people give to jockey for position. And Paul is saying, that ain't new. And it happened in my day and I'm not gonna let it happen. And I, and I think that's one of the reasons why he said, nah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not gonna take that funding because I don't, wanna, I don't want that to happen. So his, Paul's rights, he didn't, he didn't wanna receive money from Corinth but he did receive provision from Thessal the Thess Thessalonians. If you want to jot that down just to check me on it, it's 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. But so why did he refuse su support? Why did Paul refuse the support? It's a good question. And I mean, I'd love to hear from you, but the problem is, is the Bible already tells us why he, why he refused the support. And he, he did it three reasons. Are you ready? They all start with C. Are you ready? Are you ready? No, you're not ready. I'm gonna start over right now. No, I'm kidding. Uh, conviction. He, he, he refused financial support because of conviction. Verse, the last part of verse 15, he says, for I would rather die. Are you kidding me? That is not a loose, ah, you know, I mean, I'm good. You don't have to. You know, I'll take a gift card. That'll be fine. That's not what he's saying. No, it's literally, it is a steep conviction. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna get in the way of what the Lord's called me to do. He says, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no rounds for boasting. It does, I'm not gonna boast. And here's what Paul is saying. Paul, when he says, when I begin to preach the gospel, when I begin to think and I audibly, and you'll see this if you begin to share the gospel with people more and more, you'll begin to realize just how dirty, just how insignificant, just how um, sinful you really were before you met Christ. And then when you walk through and you begin to articulate out loud to people of how you met Christ, you will be even, you will be floored and sent to the mat and you will be on, like you'll be so, your mind will be blown so big that there's a, even a way for you to be saved. That God even provided a way for us to be saved is a miracle in and of itself. And so then as he begins to articulate the message of the gospel, he realizes just how sinful he was and how much he needed that savior and then how much he has changed him. And really what I call that is a gospel revolution in his own heart. So it saved him, but then it grew him in his faith. And so he began to realize, dude, I can't boast. I can do nothing apart from God. There's no way that I can do anything on my own. The only reason I'm alive and God hasn't sent me down to the ground is because of his grace on my life. That is it. There is nothing awesome about Paul, though many of us would go, yes, there is. That's why we're studying 1 Corinthians right now because there's plenty of awesome things about you. But Paul would say, if he were standing before you and me today, he would say, no, sir, and no, ma'am. The only reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because of Jesus. And so if there's anything to boast in, it's to boast in the fact that he is a good God and I am an awful sinner and that he stepped in his infinite grace and mercy and ran towards me and he chose me and he wrapped me up and I couldn't relent and I couldn't let go and I gave in to what the Holy Spirit was doing and he has wrapped me up as a part of the family of God. And that created this idea that I've got to boast in just how awesome the Lord is in my life and I can't help but share that and I can't help but share that it reminds me of stories where I've seen person after person after person who has encountered the risen Christ in their life and they've met him in a very very real way and they literally are the most obnoxious Christians in the world sharing their faith all the time and I say obnoxious and you laugh because I'm laughing on the inside right now but the reality is that's Paul and that's what really all of us should be. But yet in our Western culture, we have gotten so chubby spiritually and so comfortable and so cozy. And Paul would have much to say to you and me today 
about that position. He would say, if you've encountered the risen Christ, you've had that revolution in your soul and you can't help but share it is what he would say. And that's exactly what he does say. He says, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. And then he says, for necessity is laid upon me. He's saying, I can't help it. The prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9 says that he tried to not share uh, and preach the gospel where God had called him to. And the Bible says that fire shuddered up in his bones and that he could not help but deliver the message, the life-changing message to the people who were far from God. And he was fire in his bones. He could, he was shaking with intensity. He could not help it. And Paul's going, dude, I can't help it because I was dead and now I'm alive. And if you really believe that you were dead before you met Christ and that you are really alive, then you would feel the same way too. And then he says this, and what a great phrase that I think can help us all. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. You know what he's saying there? Judgment awaits upon me if I do not share. Woe to me. That's what a woe is. It is the judgment of God on a person. Woe to me if I do not do that. I don't know about you, but that sounds like conviction to me. (laughs) Deep-seated conviction. And then he says, number two, calling. Calling is why he's going to refuse. Verse 17, for if I do this on my own will, I have a reward. But if I do, but if not my own will, I am entrusted with a stewardship. You get a reward for something that you choose. So, if your kid chooses to pick up their room, now granted they should just do that, right? Who's with me on that? Every parent in the room should say amen on that one. But man, if they do it without ever tell, you telling them to do that, everybody in the house is getting a cookie tonight. Because they chose, right? Okay, Paul didn't choose this life. He was called to it. The Bible says in Acts chapter nine and verse 15 that Jesus said of Paul, you are my chosen instrument to carry my name into the temple courts, into the high priest, and basically to the ends of the earth. And so Paul would have never chosen that. Why do we know that? Because he was on the road to kill Christians. And his path was, what he was choosing was towards destruction, and God saved him from that. And he swept in, and he pulled him from that, and he had a calling in his life, and God chose that, not him. And so that calling, he said, don't get in the way of that calling. I can't let you get in the way of this calling. He said, I'm a steward. That's where we get that word. It's really called, I've got a calling over my life. Another reason is uh, contribution. Why 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 would he refuse? It's conviction, it's calling, and then it's contribution. He had a contribution to make. What was it? Verse 18, what then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge. Free of charge. So, and what what does free of charge mean? You don't need to go to seminary to know that. It means free of charge. What does free mean? No payment. No expectation. I just lay it down and if you pick it up, listen, if if I give you a gift and you don't accept it, I could give a rip if God told me to do it, right? Or maybe that's just me. If God told me to give you something and you chose not to accept it, that's on you, not on me. That's what Paul's saying. He said, this gift of this preaching, whether you accept it or not, I just want to do it free. So as to make full use of my right. So as not to make my full use of my right in the gospel. He's saying, it is my full right to expect you to support and to cover me and Barnabas and to cover your pastors and to do that. But I am choosing to do something else. Because I don't want you to think I'm greedy. I don't want you to think I'm money hungry. I don't want you to think that I'm doing this for the wrong reasons. I want you to know that I'm doing it to advance the kingdom of God and I love you. That's why I'm doing it. One of Paul's major motivations was his love. His love for God and his love for other people. And we see that throughout this entire story. 
So Paul had rights, and we already walked through those. His refusal of rights, and then Paul's goal with refusing his rights. Are you ready? His goal, the utter goal, we're about to wrap this up here, and then I got a few questions for you. Contextualize to evangelize. That was his goal. His goal was to contextualize to evangelize. Well, what in the world are you saying, man? Well, here's what I'm saying. He was, wi- he was willing to become a servant to everyone. Contextualize to reach them for Christ. Here's this, where it's at in the scripture. I didn't make this up myself, okay? He says it in verse 14, for, or verse 19, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant. Does anybody's Bible say slave right there? Oh, that's a great translation right there. Slave, okay? And I'll talk about that in a second. A slave to all that I might win more of them. He was willing to become a servant. The better word is slave. It's more graphic. It brings the feeling and the idea of the nation of Israel going into Egypt and spending 400 years in slavery to a master who oppressed them. It speaks of our bentness after we uh, receive Christ to righteousness, that we are a slave to righteousness. We are a slave to Christ. It's the picture in the Old Testament of a a slave who would work a certain amount of time for their master, and after the approximate time, he would have a decision to be free or to choose to be that master's slave by his own choice because he loved the master and he wanted to serve the master. And what would happen is he would get an all in his ear, more like modern day gauges to identify him with that master that he is willingly serving him no matter the cost because he loves him. And Paul is saying, I've been alled to you, to all of these people as a slave and a servant to all people. Is that not convicting to anybody in the house tonight to go that he's doing that to everyone so that he could win some of them? He gives examples of these. How, he, how does he contextualize? He becomes like a Jew. Verse 20, he says, to the Jew I became <laughs> as a Jew. Why? In order to win some. He does another one. He says, to those under the law, that would be believing uh, Jewish people, uh, uh, religious people. Um, he, he came to them uh, using the, their rights and their customs and the way they dressed and the way that they talked and the way that they, uh, the, their festivals and all those types of things. I became just like you to reach you. He also said in verse 21, uh, to the outsiders, he became like those uh, that were unbelieving Gentiles. Why? So that he might win those outside of the law. And then verse 22, he became I put the word simple, it's probably a better word. Uh, He became simple in his approach. That's how he needed to be contextualized to evangelize. Paul never watered down the truth. That's why these people in Corinth were frustrated with him. He never shied away from a theological argument when he thought somebody was wrong. Never, not one time. He'd be the guy at the mine right now telling me to shut up. I'm telling you right now, that's what he would do. He would never shy away from that. But an effort to reach some, you know what he did? The Bible says that to the weak, he became weak. It's weak in understanding. They just didn't fully grasp how he was saying it. So he would tweak the way he was saying it without tweaking the message so that they could receive the gospel. Because why? Because love compelled him. Love trumped the method all the time. Whether it's to a Jew, to a Gentile, to a religious person, to somebody who doesn't quite get it, he was like, dude, I love you enough to come at you the way that you ought to receive it. He did it in the book of Acts when he was in... um uh, Athens, and he saw that the, the Romans had uh, tombs and, and, uh, and statues of all kinds of their gods, and they had this one uh, like uh, little idol that it was the idol of the unknown gods. So if they didn't get all of the ones that they thought they knew, this one covers all the ones we don't know about, okay? And he says, I see that you've got an idol of an unknown god. Let me tell you about your unknown god. Boom, talks about the God of the Bible, Yahweh. He becomes all things to all men so that they might be saved. Now, some would say, well, then does that mean that if he looks at a thief and he says, I'm gonna be like a thief so that I can reach thieves? Well, I'm gonna be like a hooker so that I can reach hookers. I'm gonna be like a drug addict so I can reach drug addicts. Well, that's preposterous. 
If it causes you to sin to reach someone to Christ, then you're not doing what the Bible has called you to do. If you're going to sin in order to reach someone, then I doubt you're doing it, pardon this, for the right reasons. Listen to his love, verse 23. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. I wanted to be a part of the family. I wanted to come along this journey with me. I wanted to be doing this together. That's why I'm doing it. And then he invites everybody on this awesome race. And this is what he says. Because the reality is, as Paul's talking about evangelizing, and that's this whole thing, this whole thing is is saying, I don't want you to pay me so that I can reach more people, which sounds like an oxymoron because in our day, we would say, I think I can reach more people if I just get on staff with the church, right? If I can just do that, then I, I can devote all of my time to that, which is true. You do get to do that. But there are a lot of things you don't know that we do that you would go, and then we go, man, if we sometimes just were able to go do what you do, we'd be around more people who don't know Jesus. It's a really a kind of a catch-22 at times. Am I right? I got two guys right here. They know. It's a, what it's like sometimes. It's a, uh, it's a catch-22 piece here. But Paul says, I'm inviting everybody on this journey. And he says in verse 24, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? He's inviting everybody into the journey of contextualizing and evangelizing. And he says, now check this out. Uh, he's inviting everybody into the race. And immediately these people are thinking two things, Olympics and the Ithmian Games. The Ithmian games were held in Corinth every two years. And the race was like CrossFit's fittest person on earth. You had so much honor, so much fame, so much money, so much of everything. And this was the coveted prize. And he's saying, listen, as those people run that race, you're in a race too, man. You're in a race too. And he says, but only one receives the prize in the Ithmian games. So run that you may obtain it. Run that you may obtain it. Here's four racing realities in this race. A, you gotta run. Run so that you obtain it. You gotta be in the game. You gotta be thinking like Paul's calling us to do, to contextualize, to evangelize. You gotta look at your spot. Everybody in this room, other than three people that I know of that are on staff full-time right now, and if you're in here and you are, awesome. I just don't see you. Here it is. You're a tent maker. You got tents to make tomorrow morning at 8.30 or 9 or whatever time you go to the office. And Paul is saying, you wake up tomorrow morning and you are in a race and you run the race. Not the race that he talks about in Timothy, not the race that they talk about in Hebrews, but you're running the race to reach people for Christ. That's what you're doing. And you wake up that way and think that way. And he says, you gotta run, you gotta do it. And then number two, it takes discipline, verse 25. He says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things and they do it to receive a perishable wreath but we do it to receive an imperishable wreath. He's saying that the athletes of the people, James over here likes to do the, what's your martial art thing? What is it? What's it called? Muay Thai. And this guy always posts on social media, I ran 75 miles today in three minute miles and I broke 48 bricks. And, the, and, and I only eat cow and lettuce. That's not totally true. I'm, a, I'm exaggerating just a little bit. Uh, but uh, he, he talks, uh, I, I'm enamored by the commitment that you have to do what you do. And you discipline your body, you're self-controlled, you say no to the things that everybody else says yes to so that you can say yes to the things that you know you're called to. And that's exactly what he's saying that these people would do for these, they would train for years, amateur athletes in these games. And they would train, 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 train. And then they would go out and they would run and only one stinking person wins the race. And Paul is saying, you know what? If you wake up tomorrow morning and you know that you're running the race, everybody can run and everybody can win. See, these people run for fame. They run for fortune. They run for money. They run for prestige. And those wreaths literally in their day were made of sticks and they would fade, they would crumble and they would become dust. And Paul is saying, but you, oh loved one at Corinth, you are running a race. You are running a race which runs from now until Jesus returns and then that race will end and you have a part to play and you have a message to share and I want you to wake up tomorrow morning and I want you to know that you can run and you can 
can obtain the imperishable prize of leading people to Christ. And if you've never done that, then let me tell you something. That'll be the first day you felt like you've been alive in your life. It's powerful. This race takes vigilance. It takes discipline, but it takes vigilance. Verse 26, so I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. Paul was in a fight, but he wasn't in a fight against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the principalities of the dark world. He's not fighting aimlessly. He's vigilant, paying attention and knowing exactly what's going on. And then it takes commitment to finish. But I discipline my body and commit it under, keep it under self-control. And Paul's whole thing is, because here's why, here's why. Here's why I don't want your money. Here's why I don't want all these other things that all these other people want. Here's why, because I don't, I know myself, I know my flesh, and I don't want to disqualify myself. I don't want to be taken out of the game. I don't want to be taken out of the race. I want to be found faithful with my boots on the ground until the Lord calls me or until he comes back. That's what I want to do. This is Paul putting forth not a really easy topic for us. And I was really looking at this and thinking, I really have to share this the first week we come back from the mine, really? But it's truth. And the question is now comes in a couple of things here. Let me me ask you a couple of questions here. Paul was really willing to give up his rights, was he not? Who would agree? Was he, was he, did he have a right to be paid? Let me add. Applic- we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna interpret by voting, yes. So he had every right. And so if Paul is saying that, he's actually modeling for us, when, is it, when do we give up our rights in order to do the greater right, if you will? So think about this. When should we be willing to give up our rights? Think about your life, think about life in general. When should we be willing to give up our rights as Paul gave up his? Say it right here. Say it again, I can't hear you. When we become saved, we immediately give up our rights. That's a good one. What else? Something for Monday. Yes, sir. To bring others to Christ. So when we get saved and then to bring others to Christ. What might be some practical rights that we give up? that God might be calling on you right now in your heart that you would go, that's not sin. It's one of those gray areas, but that God might be calling us to give up to reach more people. What could that be? Paul's already talked about one of them. Previous chapter. Food, meat. I'm not gonna argue with a guy over whether it's sacrificed to idols or not. If it's gonna cause him to stumble, I'm just not gonna do it. What might be something in your life that may be super practical or Christians' lives, if you don't want to get super personal, that we, would give, that we should think about maybe giving up that might be a stumbling block for other people to come to faith in Christ? Huh? Alcohol. It's definitely a gray area in Scripture. It says don't get drunk, but it doesn't say you can't partake. So it's a gray area, but if you know that it's going to cause someone to stumble, stumble what does the mature believer do? I forego my liberty, right? I heard, uh, I jotted this down in the margin of my Bible. John MacArthur once said, our rights end when another person is offended. Our rights end when another person is offended. What are some other, uh, some other examples? Types of, movies. Types of movies. Okay. So I can't answer that for you personally, but I think as I was preparing this, I was thinking about you and I was thinking about, I didn't know who was gonna be here and I thought, There is definitely going to be something that every single one of us can go, you know what? That's a freedom I have. That's a right that I have that I need to evaluate if I need to continue to do that. Because oftentimes we're not even, we're we're oblivious to the fact that it might be causing someone to stumble. And so if we allow ourselves to go, God, through the lenses of what we've learned by Paul, he's setting an example for Corinth. He's setting an example for us to say, hey, Lord, Lord, is this hindering my wife from growing spiritually? Is this preventing my children from coming to faith? Is this putting a gap between me and my neighbor? 
And would you get me to the place of I can't help but preach? It has been thrusted upon me to share with them. So whatever it is that I need to do, I'll forego it. And this gets us to the point that this evangelistic strategy that I was raised under in my particular denomination is very mass-produced tracts, nothing wrong with that, but really Paul is antithetical to that kind of evangelism. He's saying that you gotta know that person, man. You gotta know them, you gotta live life with them. That's what the race is about. It's about, this is what he's saying, it's very personal. I was a Jew to a Jew, I was an outsider to an outsider, an insider to insider, I was a, a weak with the weak, I was strong with the strong. I knew those people and I did contextualize with them so that they could come to faith in Christ. So what it does for you and what it does for me as we leave this place is to think this. Who am I spending my time with when I'm not here and when I'm not at work? Let me ask you one more question. What does it mean to be all things to all people? When Paul says, I'm gonna be all things to all people so that I might win some, what does that mean? To be an example. example. Yes, sir. A bridge builder, builder. I love that. There are some reasons why people don't come to faith in Christ and Paul's saying, just don't make it you as a person. Let it be Jesus. Make it as easy as you can. I've heard Lynn say this several times. Make it easy as you can to get people to the cross. But man, let the cross be the offensive thing. Let the cross be the one that calls people on the carpet, not you as a person. Well, I think this has been super convicting for me. I don't know about you because this is a hard thing for us to talk about. It's a hard conversation to have. And... What I want you to think about when you leave here today is, what, what, listen, hear me, what is it that I'm doing that might be causing someone to not come to faith in Christ, to might be stunting growth? And what I wanna do is I wanna be all things to all people so that they could be one because I love God and I love them and I'll put aside my liberty, whatever it may be, the payment thing is just an example that Paul's giving. It could be a myriad of things in your life and set that aside. Why? so that you could win them. And so that heaven could be populated by you sharing your faith and an army of us doing that. I can't imagine what that would look like if 10 people in this room actually got fired up about that. We'd change our entire metropolitan area with 10 people who said, woe is me if I do not share, if I do not preach. And I'll do whatever I can to get those obstacles out of the way. Let me pray for us. Father, Thank you for your word. Sometimes it works like a sword (laughs) or a sawzall and it just hack away. And then sometimes it works like a scalpel and it's super, 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 super fine. And that's kind of what your word did tonight for us is it got really narrow, really quick and pointed into this one specific area. But God, I would pray that, um, that we really think through what it might be in our hearts that would cause us or that might cause other brothers or sisters around us to not come to faith and we want to get those away. So may we take 1 Corinthians 9, may we meditate on it because the words here spoken tonight aren't powerful but it's your word that's powerful and may it speak to our soul and change us. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right guys, thank you for being here. We'll see you next week.